Good evening, everybody. Welcome, and as always, thank you very much for coming. Um, it's a great pleasure to have with us this evening our speaker, Professor David Souza of the University of Texas at Austin. He's been there for most of his career, and for a good chunk of it, he's been chair of the department. In these days of academic specialization, he's perhaps unusual in that he's published on a wide variety of areas, not only the philosophy of language, but also epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics. He is the um, editor of the Oxford Companion to Analytic Philosophy, and also the founding editor of the journal Analytic Philosophy. Now, somewhere or other in Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein says, a philosophical problem is when I don't know my way about. Um, but I think David is, as far as I know, not going to be addressing a Wittgensteinian topic this evening. Somewhere between the printed version and the version of his title that you see on the screen, the italics have fortunately been added back in. So he's not going to say, talk about how to get about, but how to get about. David, over to you. Thank you. Well, uh, let me start by thanking uh, the Royal Institute for, um, well, first for their very long and successful um, support and promotion of philosophy, um, both in the academy and also in the public. I'm, I'm honored uh, to be invited to give a lecture in this series, and I appreciate um, your attendance. So yeah, my, my talk is called How to Get About, and um, because we're in Bloomsbury, I thought I'd begin with Forster. Um, I'm told that Keynes' old mansion is just across Gordon Square, um, so it's, I guess, at least geographically appropriate. Remember in Howard's End, uh, the brilliant imperative, only connect. Forget all about the quiz show, um, but philosophically speaking, what is this connection business that's so important? Perhaps our first paradigm of connection is found in physical proximity. When things touch, they're connected in an obvious and recognizable way. But even as we note that fact, uh, we can already appreciate that the significance of the phenomenon of connection is not revealed particularly in that form, in the form of physical touch. When touch matters, it matters because of its constituting some more abstract form of connection. So the question remains. Indeed, certainly from the perspective of the Bloomsbury Group, physical touch is too gross a relation, not in the sense of disgust, not in the American version of gross, but too brutal, too lacking in charm, too unrefined to be our exemplar of connecting, to be the connecting of only connect. And to make matters worse, it's a bit unclear what touching could itself amount to. So what could connecting be that it should matter? Does connecting matter at all, after all? And if so, why? In Forster's case, the idea of connecting involved building a bridge between passion and prose, between the beast and the monk that are in us all. Without such a bridge, Forster says, we are meaningless fragments. So the idea is that connection creates, indeed is what creates, meaningfulness. It preempts absurdity and fragmentation. So the idea is that without connection, there is fragmentation, there is meaninglessness. Only through connection, only through the whole that's created through connection, is there meaningfulness. So that's what connection has to achieve for us. Forster suggests that some special relation, what he calls a rainbow bridge, between what might be conceived as initially isolated elemental parts of ourselves, the beast and the monk, the passion and the prose. This rainbow bridge will suffice, but is required also for a range of deep values. And they're not enumerated in the novel, of course, but I'll enumerate them for you. Beauty, 
Forster says that the bridge would be built, well, it's Margaret whose mind is being spoken in the novel at this time, but anyway, the bridge would be built and span their lives with beauty, exaltation, and both will be exalted. The references to the prose and the passion. Happiness, happy the man who sees from either aspect. Love, with the connecting bridge, love is born. And even salvation, the salvation that was latent in his own soul. So these significant phenomena are put forward as requiring and as being achieved through connection. Now, most explicitly, the conceptual scheme is applied in the novel to the inner workings of a single mind, the single mind or person or soul, that of Mr. Wilcox. But Forster is clearly using that individual case as a kind of model, as a metaphor for the connection between individuals and other things, including connections between individuals, uh, between people, and between families. Anyway, connections between individuals that can yield the same sorts of benefits collectively as they do in the individual case. Connected to each other and to other things, we can be beautiful and exalted. We can love and be loved, and we can find salvation. Now, whether or not the individual case, the case of connections between the parts in a single person should have any priority, we can anyway attend directly, philosophically, to the sorts of connection between ourselves and other things that are ultimately the broader theme of Forster's novel and of interest to anyone. So again, what could it be to connect? What could connection amount to that it could have the sorts of valuable product that Forster identifies? And this is, you know, I guess a key moment of the presentation. I propose that one deep form of connection is when something is about something. The being about relation. Being about is an important variety of connecting. Or so I propose. <coughs> so when we think about someone, we're connected to them. Near or far, spatially or temporally, there they are, almost miraculously, with us. In the 80s, in the United States, there was a well-known ad campaign for AT&T with the jingle reach out and touch someone is for a long distance telephone service. And the kind of uh, effect of the ad was to remind us of this possibility of engaging with someone uh, very far away. Of course, in that case, uh, there's a different sort of mechanism involved, of course. But just generally, the idea of being with someone in thought seems to have a certain recognizable, special quality. But also when we engage each other about something, for example, in discussion, then we're connected to that thing too. We're discussing it, we're talking about it. And since we are talking about it, we're engaged with each other in a discussion. Indeed, our being so engaged depends on our discussion being about the same thing. Otherwise, we're talking past each other. What it is to be discussing, as opposed to just making noises in each other's vicinity, is for there to be a something that we're talking about. Both. So now consider the significance of this form of connection. Without the being about anything of a thought, the thinker is rendered isolated. The thought exhibits a lack of friction. There's a kind of um, you know, isolation of 
the phenomenon without about this. And if when we talk, we are not together talking about one thing, then we're not having a conversation. We're not in that way in community, in the way that we think of conversations as enabling, being constituting. We are to that extent not in society. So without our ideas connecting to reality through representing it, we are very deeply alone. So I'm wanting the connecting of only connect, which is going to yield these deep values. At least one possibility for it, I'm wanting it to be about this. Because by connecting that way, we avoid isolation and alienation. We avoid being alone. Okay, so I think all that encourages the conclusion that when one thing is about another, they have connected in an important way. Now, the examples I gave are of thoughts and ideas, and then also of discussion and talk. Being about things is something a mind can be involved in, and is also something a bit of language can do. So let's pursue this relation of about this further. How does it work? In his philosophical investigations, and elsewhere actually, Wittgenstein asked, what makes my image of him into an image of him? In virtue of what is an image that I'm having? It's an image of him. In virtue of what is that image of him? An image of him as opposed to of someone else, or of no one at all. It's a question about what, what makes for being of. And he then wondered, isn't my question like this? What makes this sentence a sentence that has to do with him? The first it was about images. He wonders, isn't that question about images just like this question about sentences? And then he contemplates a possible answer to that, and then says, yeah, but what makes our conversation about him a conversation about him? So notice first the range of ways in which we characterize the phenomenon. Wittgenstein is translated as speaking of <clears throat> images being of someone, of sentences having to do with things. So the, phenom the phenomenon of being about is sometimes rendered as the phenomenon of being of, or having to do with. I'm using being about as the base case, but there's also betokening, denoting, going proxy for, indicating, Meaning, referencing, or referring, or referring to, representing, signaling, standing for, symbolizing, and there's more. There's a very wide range of ways of, well, referring to this phenomenon. And I think that wide range of ways of referring to the phenomenon suggests some level of appreciation of the phenomenon and some level of attention to it by us collectively. We have all sorts of ways to talk about this phenomenon of being about. I don't think that's an accident. So that was one thing I wanted to notice. But now notice second that like many before him and since, Wittgenstein in effect unifies questions about what makes for aboutness in the case of language and what makes for aboutness in the case of thought. He unifies the question about what makes this image of him an image of him. He unifies that with the question, what makes this sentence about him a sentence about him? What makes this conversation a conversation about him? And so assuming that images are constituents of our thought, part of our consciousness, he's thinking that these are, in effect, the same question. He's not alone in that unificatory presupposition. Let me give you some more examples. Here's Kit Fine making the idea explicit in his semantic relations. Fine says, the simplest and most natural view is that there is no more to the content of my belief than there is to the content of my words. It is odd to suppose that there should be any fundamental difference in the general representational character 
of language and thought. So the representing phenomenon that language is involved in is of the same character as the representing phenomenon that thought is involved in. Or so fine. Uh, <coughs> and here's Stephen Schiffer and his remnants of meaning. Both mental states and sentences have what is called intentionality or representational content. A particular sentence means that worms do not have noses, and a particular state is a belief that worms do not have noses. What the theorist ultimately wants, of course, is a general theory of content, a theory of linguistic and representation. So, I hope you can see that in Schiffer and Fine, and in the series of questions that Wittgenstein asked, there is implicit throughout this idea that the aboutness of language and the aboutness of thought um, are coordinate phenomena, this is more phenomena structurally <coughs> the same. Adopting a slightly different angle, Jerry Fodor in his psychosemantics worried about whether intentionality is a natural phenomenon, because natural is an ambiguous uh, term, but so there's sort of two things going on at once in this quotation, but let's just work through it. Fodor said, I suppose that sooner or later the physicists will complete the catalog they've been compiling of the ultimate and irreducible properties of things. When they do, the likes of spin, charm, and charge will perhaps appear on their list. But aboutness surely won't. Intentionality doesn't go that deep. If aboutness is real, it must really be something else. So I think the main thing that Fodor is emphasizing there is that aboutness is a phenomenon that doesn't occur at, in some sense, the basic level of reality. Aboutness has to be understood in terms of more fundamental phenomena. But whether Fodor is right about that or not, notice that he too seems to take for granted that it is simplex, because he talks about it. He doesn't talk about the varieties of intentionality, the varieties of being about, varieties of aboutness. Okay, well, out of tune with this symphony, I will propose instead not one, but two things for aboutness really to be. So I'm gonna, in a way, accept uh, Fodor's main point that we can appeal to other relations in order to understand the relation of aboutness. We won't take aboutness as our fundamental relation. We won't just say, well, aboutness is aboutness. It's primitive. We'll understand it in terms of something else. We'll understand them, as it were the varieties about this in terms of other things. But it will be, it will be um, bifurcated. I think the unificatory presupposition that contrasts with the position I'll recommend is reasonable. It's not that I think that was a stupid idea. There are good reasons for supposing that any account of what makes a word mean what it means must serve equally as an account of what makes a thought be about what it represents. Um, you know, Fine and Fodor and Wittgenstein and Schiffer, they're, they're all um, deep thinkers and um, they didn't get to their position uh, willy-nilly. We do seem to be able to put our thoughts into words. Looks like the thing that makes our thought connect, the content of our thought, um, is a thing that we can deliver in linguistic form. That just seems very reasonable. When, when you say something, I can believe it. The thing that connects the linguistic item to reality, the meaning of the sentence, looks like I can get it in mind. I can believe it. And then my thought, my belief, is then connected to reality in just the way the linguistic item was. I take up into my thought 
the meaning of your sentence. And now we have a corresponding connection between um, our thought and reality as we had between language and reality. And so what's this business that I'm defending, this opposing view? Nevertheless, I recommend we reconsider the presupposition. So though it may look initially unattractive, I'm gonna recommend that we reconsider it. I think what controversy there has been about the relation between the linguistic and the mental case has mainly concerned priority over whether, basically which comes first has been the issue. Whether having language is somehow a precondition of thought, we think in some sense because we are linguistic creatures, so that linguistic meaning is to that extent prior to, somehow precedes the meanings of thoughts. Um, or maybe that they come uh, together, they're sort of coeval phenomena. Or instead, reversing the order, um, what is maybe an initially very attractive uh, idea that, that you know, there's sort of the meanings of our thoughts and then we invest language with these, these meaningful thoughts that we have independently and prior. Linguistic meaning is somehow the product of mental content. But my proposal rejects both, both sides of that debate. Notice that both sides of the debate presuppose that the relevant linguistic phenomenon and the case of mental meaning can be ordered in terms of priority along some relevant dimension. Any debate over priority requires a dimension along which the items can be arranged to allow for an ordering. But the suggestion I'm wanting us to try to get into view here tonight is that neither precedes the other. Neither comes before the other. They're independent phenomena. Does the primacy of five precede the redness of the fire engine? Or is one posterior or, is, you know, or should we reverse the order of priority? It doesn't make sense. It's just different. They, they don't, neither has any priority. With it. I'm claiming, and I, I want it to feel just now a bit implausible, because otherwise what's the fun of pulling the rabbit out of the hat, um, that they're actually independent in something like that way. Okay, I won't here show how I accommodate the point about communicating our thoughts in language. The earlier point that I suggested is powerful support for the idea that the phenomena are similar, maybe the same, that we need a common theory of both phenomena. I do appreciate the need to do so. One has to contend with the most powerful issues for one's own view. Um, I'll give you the rough idea. It's that sentences don't actually need to represent in just the way thoughts do in order for communication to proceed. There is a simple model, the one that I sketched out, which is just you have a thought and you put it into words or there's a meaning of a sentence and you just take that up into that very meaning, you just take that up into your thought so that there's an identity between the meaning of the, the linguistic item and the content of your thought. That's the simple model. And that certainly would serve in explanation of how communication works, but I'm thinking we don't need that much. Uh, we don't need to be so strongly committed in order to understand the way communication works. So I think there will be the possibility of a response to that challenge. Um, but as I say, I won't, I won't take that up here tonight. In any case, an adequate development of this recommendation would take, at a minimum, the completion of a book project that I currently have in regress. But let's make a start. Let's make a start here tonight by reviewing two key philosophical texts, one by the epical German logician, Gottlob Frege, and another by the generational American philosopher, sadly recently deceased, Saul Kripke. My hope is that reviewing passages from these philosophers' texts, even briefly, will begin to show us the advantages of a position according to which the phenomenon of aboutness is not uniform, 
but is instead multiform. I, I think the connection to a thing that's achieved when we can name it or discuss it, we can talk about it, um, is of a fundamentally different sort from that implicit in our getting something in mind. So that's what I'm wanting you to sort of try to hold uh, in your mind right now. The suggestion is that what we're gonna get out of these texts is that there's, we're, we're best served by thinking that the phenomenon of getting something in mind is a different kind of phenomenon than the phenomenon of naming something or referring to it or talking about it. The aboutness it's implicit in talking about is a different kind of aboutness, that's the idea, okay. All right, well, let's start with Frege. Frege said in 1895, the discovery that the rising sun is not new every morning, but always the same, was one of the most fertile astronomical discoveries. So his general issue is about the possibility of believing one thing without believing another. It's the making of a discovery, fertile astronomical discovery. It's about having a thought with one significance without having another yet, only discovering it at a later time, a different thought. The discovery is the coming into possession of a new thought with a different significance. So that was the issue he confronted. Uh, Frege's puzzle, as it's now known, was specifically about how we might already believe that, for example, Hesperus is Hesperus, without yet knowing that Hesperus is Phosphorus. Phosphorus is just another name for the same planet, planet Venus. So we discover the latter, we discover that Hesperus is Phosphorus. The ancient astronomer Hammurabi maybe discovered that Hesperus is Phosphorus, even while already having the sort of trivial belief that, of course, Hesperus is Hesperus. This sort of phenomenon is very widespread, okay? I don't know how to pronounce Mother Teresa's name, but that is the first name. Um, anyway, I give you a bunch of names. Uh, you may know some of them, you may not. Um, but anyway, it's a very widespread phenomenon. I could sort of, maybe I just now enabled you to know that Mother Teresa is Agnes. And you learn something when you learn that Mother Teresa is Agnes. But of course you knew that Mother Teresa is Mother Teresa. And you presuppose that Agnes, whoever she is, is Agnes. Is what we learn when we learn that Cicero is Tully just what we already knew when we knew that Cicero is Cicero? The right answer has to be no. On the other hand, isn't Cicero's being Tully, that thing we learn when we learn that Cicero is Tully, isn't that just a matter of his self-identity, his being himself? The way the world has to be for Clemens to be Twain is just how it has to be for that individual to be himself. There's nothing more to Clemens being Twain than for that individual to be himself. So here's one way to pose the philosophical issue Frege in effect confronted. If what the sentence Cicero is Cicero means is just what the sentence Cicero is Tully means and what we have in mind when we believe that Cicero is Cicero is just what the sentence means, then we did already believe that Cicero is Tully. I think maybe it's helpful to say to diagnose things in the following way, Frege basically rejects one, and I'm proposing that we reject two. Two gets widely presupposed, and a lot of philosophy is dedicated to confronting one, given how unappealing three is. But I think we should revisit two. Frege's solution was to introduce a new kind of semantic value for words, to rethink the way words connect to the reality that they refer to. But I think actually, in retrospect, Frege's maneuver should seem quite strange. How could it possibly help to solve a problem about what our beliefs are, what our beliefs are about, how something could be a discovery, given what we already knew? How could it possibly help with that issue to reconceive the way our words refer. He confronted an issue about discoveries and he solved it by adding a semantic value to words. WTF, they say in the States. The problem confronted was to explain a thinker's believing that Hesperus is Hesperus without believing that Hesperus is Phosphorus. And the solution offered was that words like Hesperus 
have a more complicated signification than we had realized. Something about how the planet is presented to us is incorporated into the word's meaning, Frege said, and that's going to solve our problem. He saw a difference in the cognitive potential of minds that do and don't already believe that Hesperus is phosphorus and inferred that the meaning of the sentence Hesperus is phosphorus, the way that sentence is about what it is about, has to be able to explain that difference in cognitive potential. The difference in cognitive potential between those who do and do not believe that Hesperus is phosphorus. We can identify a kind of assumption behind that maneuver. No distinction in cognitive potential without some distinction in linguistic semantics. The assumption proposes a kind of isomorphism between what people do and don't believe on one hand and the meanings of the sentences we might use to state what they do and don't believe. View the path I'm proposing here as an alternative to that. It's an alternative to that path, the path that was taken in what has come to be called the linguistic turn. I'm claiming that the nature and structure of linguistic meaning is not, contrary to the key idea of the linguistic turn, a good model for thought and how it represents. Frege did appreciate something very deep. We need theoretical materials adequate to explain distinctions as fine-grained as can be made by an arbitrarily powerful rational mind. The contents of our beliefs, what our beliefs are about, have to be understood in a way that'll account for that, account for the fact that you can perfectly rationally believe that Hesperus is Hesperus, and if you just haven't done the astronomy yet, you won't yet believe that Hesperus is phosphorus. But Frege, remember, I, that's all, I, all that stuff I said was about a rational mind and what it believes. But Frege remained committed to a problematic unification of the linguistic case and the case of thought. Confronted by subjects whose rational beliefs differ in a familiar way, a way perhaps yours did before you heard about Agnes, he proposed a new theory of linguistic meaning and used it, as I would say, indirectly to account for all our intuitions. I think we should separate more sharply the way thoughts connect to reality from the way language does. Though the best linguistic theory may ultimately make the starred sentence, the whole sentence, that whole thing after the star, the best linguistic theory may actually make that sentence false. We can still understand the true thought one might have tried to voice with it. You see, Frege attractively makes the starred sentence true. And I think that's, you know, one's immediate reaction to that start sentence. It is true. Lois believes Superman flies is true, even while Lois believes Clark Kent flies is false. And that's because Lois does believe that Superman flies and doesn't believe that Clark Kent flies. I hope you're all familiar with the, the Superman fiction. I don't know how uh, local that is. Um, so that looks true, and, and Frege makes it true. What I'm suggesting is that maybe the best way around this area is to accept the falsity of star. Let me say a little bit more. My brief is to show how we might ultimately want to allow that star is false because of the troubles that Frege's semantics, which make it true, run into with Kripke, as we'll see in a minute. So Frege provides a semantics that makes it true. That's attractive. But Frege's semantics run into trouble with Kripke. So maybe we're better off living with its being false. But my brief is to show you that in so doing, we can still, with this new conceptual framework I'm proposing, we can actually capture and validate the intuitions that led us to want to count it as true. We can do all that even while we actually maintain it as, strictly speaking, false and thereby avoid the problems raised by Kripke. That's why I say that's a little bit of a, maybe a, a mouthful. But it, you know, if, you're, if there's a takeaway message, it's that, yeah, star looks true, Frege makes it true, but Frege's way of making it true runs in trouble. But we haven't contemplated the alternative I'm proposing, which is to separate the linguistic and the, let's call it the mental, in this characteristic way. And I'm claiming that if we do, 
then what led us to want it to be true can be validated, and now we won't regret as much it's turning out to be false. Because we'll understand what its falsehood consists in, but we'll have the truth in the area that we wanted, even if it's not, strictly speaking, the truth of star itself. Okay, that's our first text. We need to get to Kripke to really understand it. So, Gottlob Frege's On Sense and Reference, that seminal work I claim might not have inaugurated the century of philosophical upset that it did if Frege had been more alive to the possibility that the way language is meaningful is radically different from the way thoughts are. Without Frege's assumption about there being that isomorphism between the structure of the variation in linguistic semantics and the variation in the cognitive phenomena that he was responding to, we are not in the same way pushed in the direction of the notion of sense the notion of a kind of linguistic meaning whose theoretical role is effectively to account for familiar cognitive phenomena. So our next text is from Saul Kripke's Naming and Necessity. Kripke attacks the view of names and their meanings to which Frege was, problematically I've suggested, led by his Frege's puzzle. Again, on that view, the meaning of a name is akin to a description, the kind of thing we might have in mind when we talk about something. Kripke says, in naming necessity, let's take a simple case. In the case of Gödel, practically the only thing many people have heard about him is that he discovered the incompleteness of arithmetic. Does it follow that whoever discovered the incompleteness of arithmetic is the referent of the word Gödel? So the idea Kripke is attacking is that the way the name Gödel connects to the famous mathematician is that when we use it, we have something like you know, discoverer of the incompleteness of arithmetic in mind. That's kind of the sense of the name in our use of it. And then the mathematician is singled out by that description. That determines the referent of the name in the familiar Phrygian way. And Kripke's not having it. He says, wait, suppose that Gödel was not in fact the author of the theorem. A man named Schmidt, whose body was found in Vienna under mysterious circumstances many years ago, actually did the work in question. On the view in question then, since the man who discovered the incompleteness of arithmetic is in fact Schmidt, we, when we talk about Gödel, are in fact always referring to Schmidt. But it seems to me that we are not. We simply are not. So Kripke intends with this passage to show that the way names represent is not mediated through anything like the kind of cognitive element that senses are, anything that has the restrictions on it that Frege put on senses, the criterion of sameness in different sense that Frege used for senses, anything like that is not gonna be the sort of thing that mediates the reference of names. We don't get some properties in mind first and then somehow invest the ordinary proper name with them as its meaning. And I, I propose simply to accept that point of Kripke's. I think, I think Kripke's just right about that. These are good points about words, good points about linguistic meaning, good points about names, naming, about the way words connect with mathematicians like Gödel or with glory. Part of it is, I think, the really the useful background for that thought, the thought that I think emerges with Kripke is revealed in Humpty Dumpty's uh, monologue when he says, when I use a word, in a rather scornful tone, he says, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. I think the passage from Lewis Carroll is funny because of Humpty Dumpty's pretension. By the way, um, Lewis Carroll, Charles Dodgson, another a case of something you may have at some point in your life learned, though you always knew that Carol was himself. Anyway, the passage is funny because of Humpty Dumpty's pretension. Words don't mean just what we intend for them to mean. The meaning of a name, of a word like glory, um, is not uh, the product of the sort of cognitive materials with which you use it. Okay, so I think in Kripke's example, we use the word girdle, and in using that name, we make linguistic reference to girdle. He's absolutely right about that. But I think what hasn't, not enough attention has been paid to the fact, and not enough attention has been paid to that passage in Kripke, 
um, in a way that would reveal that the belief that the user of the name Girdle, who has discoverer of the incompleteness arithmetic in mind, as they do by stipulation of the example, what, wh who is their belief about? When they say, say they say Girdle was brilliant, they use the word Girdle, they say Girdle was brilliant, and by stipulation, what they have in mind is discover the incompleteness arithmetic. I want to emphasize that it seems plausible that in that case, their belief is about Schmidt. Schmidt's the discover the incompleteness arithmetic. So there's this bifurcation of connection. There is the subject with a certain belief content and some words come out and they connect to two people. A um, intellectual property thief named Girdle and a brilliant mathematician named Schmidt. So what emerges is that there's a way to accept Kripke's insight about names and other linguistic devices and how they represent, and even while preserving Frege's insight into the way rational minds work. Preserving Frege's explanation in some sense, although I'm gonna claim he misdeployed it, Frege's explanation for how it is that a rational subject can discover that Hesperus is phosphorus, even should they already know that Hesperus is Hesperus. So even should Frege himself has misdeployed his insight and left himself open to Kripke's rebuttal by deploying that insight, Frege, as, as a new theory of semantics for language, if we don't accept that part of Frege but preserve the raw theoretical materials and redeploy them now in the new conceptual framework, I think we get a better overall picture. So if the way minds manage the task of being about things is fundamentally different from the way words manage that task, then Frege's proposal, though he pitched it as about the way language works, can be accepted as a viable claim about the way minds work. And Kripke's insights about the way language works need not be seen as incompatible with a new conception of the contents of thought. Return now to Fodor, who you'll recall insists that aboutness has to really be something else. I said at the time of that slide um, that I would offer two things for aboutness really to be. So the aboutness of language is, I think, to be made out, as Kripke recommends, in terms of causation, indeed compatibly with the causal picture that Kripke himself proposes. The aboutness of thoughts, by contrast, is to be made out in terms of something like satisfaction, in line with the model Frege offered, though he mistakenly offered it as accounting for the reference of words. So on Frege's model, words get to be about what they're about in virtue of having a sense, something like a description, which is satisfied by the thing that the description describes. Right? So when you describe something, then that thing sort of instantiates you. I'm saying that's how thinking about works, but not how words being about works. Okay, returning then finally to Forster, we connect in more than one way. We can think of loved ones, remembering long lost ancestors as easily as we anxiously await offspring. We can consider whether worms have noses or whether to seek out a saucer of mud. We do that kind of thing, I claim, by getting properties in mind, properties that the relevant individuals instantiate. So here, uh, I want to say Frege's innovation comes to the fore, right? We think with sense. The way he thought names connect to their bearers is not how names connect to their bearers, but it is how we connect to things in thought. But we also connect in a very different sort of way with language, by naming things and referring to them and talking about them. We do that by taking advantage of causal relations that have been established between words, the words we use, and the things they thereby stand for. Notice that the way linguistic items is about things is in fact not so far from the original example of physical proximity. Words are about what they're about in virtue of physical relations, connections that take place in the space of nature. The being read of the traditional British phone booth is not the same sort of relation as that your body undergoes when you hear someone's name or see it written down. 
So the possibilities for beautiful and loving relationships, the prospect of a kind of exaltation and of salvation, the preconditions of happiness, all of those deep values that are supposed to be implicit in the kind of connection to which Forster directs us, they're all accordingly in place in more than one way. We need not be alone in the nightmare scenario postulated by the solipsist. Our thoughts provide for a satisfying connection and our language provides for yet another. If you want to get about, understanding its multiplex character is the beginning of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to you for questions. There's no roving mic this evening, so please do speak loudly. So, David, can I say what I think? Yes, please. I think no, that's wanted. my question. <laughs> <laughs> I see. That's good. Um, so, if what you mean, if the yes answer to your question entails that um, the phenomenon of your thinking what you think can be reproduced in your saying what you say, then I think the answer to your question is no. But I think that's not the right way to interpret the question. And indeed, I think the right way to interpret the question, can I say what I think, is one on which the correct answer is yes. So what I think it would be for you to say what you think is not for the phenomenon of your thinking what you think to be reproduced through your saying what you say, but rather for there to be um, the right sort of relation between the content of your thought and the meaning of your sentence, in particular the you know, expresses or says, uh, something like that. And so now I think what we need to do is investigate that relation. What's implicit in the being a statement of your belief? If it is not, as I say, it cannot be, the reproduction in a linguistic form of what something whose essence is not linguistic. Um, so that's a kind of a complicated answer, but I think, so I, you know, I, could, I could sort of cheap out and say, yes, you can, but I, 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 I think what's fair, what you're saying is, wait a minute, you claim that these are very different phenomena, but it seems like the easiest thing in the world to sort of have a thought and then express it, say it. And it looks like the conditions on successful um, expression of your thought is precisely the putting into linguistic form of your thought. I, I think that's a fair point. I, I, that's a very challenging point. And I think you know, all the work is yet to be done. I haven't done it. You're right to say that's, that's the key question. How can you say these are such different phenomenon when it looks like there is encoding in linguistic form of thoughts? Um, we're going to need a different account of encoding, one on which even successful encoding, even a successful case of saying what you're thinking is not a case in which the thinking what you're thinking by you is somehow re, re instantiated the phenomenon in question, that, you know, you're thinking that, is somehow reproduced in the, the sentences meaning that. Is, that. is that responsive? Yeah. There was a question? Yeah, over there. Hello. Um, I'm not going to argue with your central thesis, but I think that there's a clear distinction to be made between a badness of thought and a badness of language. For me, I think it's evident on the basis that I consider a badness of thought to be private and a badness of language to be public. So the first is individual, the second is social. And so I'm happy to grant you your sort of major thesis. Um, so the question I've got is not about that, but it's slightly perverse in the sense that I want to um, raise a question about the metaphysical foundation from which you start, which is to do with, you start with the concept of connection. Um, I was uh, firstly interested in how you distinguish that from simple relation, uh, where the concept connection seems a slightly more richer concept, but so I'm going to start with relation just because it's a more, it's a concept that's philosophically sort of less pleasant perhaps, or, or better understood. 
And I think if you're starting with an issue of uh, the concept of relation, um, then you must immediately address the issue of the fact that relation can either be external or internal. So the relation that you mentioned is external. Um, you uh, have two things and then a conjunction between them, like when two things touch. But there's also the internal uh, relation where you have one thing and then a disjunction and you pull things apart. So there's an alternative way of mating, making a connection, which is not to start with two things and then to see them as one, but to start with one thing and then to uh, divorce them, to separate them. And sometimes I think that this sort of rather annoying <laughs> metaphysical issue is overlooked when we're talking about, about this. Mm -hmm. We are very, very apt to jump in immediately to the idea of um, the two things and how we can join in things. Mm -hmm. And if you start with about this in that sense, and what you've got is a conjunctive relationship where some kind of priority is given to one or other side, so something is coming first. But if you start with a disjunctive view, then you have this idea that the two things which are separated are and, and equal in value. Um, I suppose one of the things that strikes me is that perhaps problems with aboutness um, could be interestingly tackled if we start with the view that perhaps thought and language start from some kind of common root and then become separated, or the referent and the uh, reference are somehow originally one and then become separated. As I say, this is sort of a metaphysical question, maybe it falls outside of um, the debate this evening. Um, as I say, I'm prepared to grant you the, the, your, your central thesis because I, I think it can be supported through a, you know, a, look, like Wittgenstein says, language is, is you know, he gives a private language argument, it's, you know, it's a public thing. And so I'm happy to see the referencing in that case done through um, as being due to a sort of public or social aspect, whereas thought can be you know supported individually. But I'm just interested in whether sort of perversely really, whether all of these debates are starting from uh, a view of uh, external relation, and they might usefully be addressed from looking at a relation that's internal, caused by a disjunct an original disjunction rather than an original conjunction. Well, there's a lot in there, and I'm not, I don't know that I'll be able to really, or that I should um, take long to respond to all of it, but I do want to hit on a few things. I'll s just to offer you some responses, just so, just so you'll um, have some reactions. Um, for what it's worth, I, I appreciate um, our sympathy on the distinction between the nature of um, linguistic aboutness and you know, the way minds get to be about things. Um, you want to bring in the notion of privacy as kind of a useful way of further understanding that and, and enriching our conceptual framework around that distinction. I have to say I'm a little hesitant about that myself for what it's worth, so we actually disagree on whether that's a useful additional element. Um, for me, the, the very idea of privacy only really makes sense um, in what I'd call the space of nature, the space within which um, the, the, ins the tools, the elements that we're going to use to make sense of linguistic reference um, are found. And the, dis the very distinction between the private and the not private in the domain, in the, in the space of reason, in the, in the space in which um, mental content is going to be understood may not, from my point of view, it may be very hard to reconstitute that distinction. It may just be no longer really makes sense. Um, so there's a little bit of disagreement for what it's worth. I, I'm not sure I'm right about that. I, I'll tell you, so that's just sort of an initial um, thought I have. Um, on the question of whether I want to abstract from connection to relation more generally, the problem is that I just think that um, there is, I agree with you that connection is, is a bit richer. Um, and it's because I think, you know, disconnection is another relation. And um, so there is, there's a kind of valence to connect something like that. There's a, there's a plus minus phenomenon going on 
Um, now you might say, well, unrelated. I mean, I, I agree that pretty soon we're getting to sort of Bradleyan regression issues, as one so often does in you know very basic metaphysics. But um, I worry that uh, that if I were to abstract as far as relation, I would lose an element that I think is implicit in the idea of connection, um, which can't you know which you, you lose if you just generalize it all the way to more the more abstract. Yeah, I agree. Well, it's meant to be, indeed, yeah. indeed, I want it to be. Um, I think you want to put together a bit, and, and maybe you're right to do so, but for what it's worth, I'm not yet there. Um, the idea of an internal relation versus an external, the distinction between internal and external relations, and then the distinction between conjunctive phenomena and disjunctive phenomena. I'm not, um, that, that's a bit challenging for me right now. I might be brought round to it eventually, but that's not my immediate way with those. I, I have those as two different kinds of distinctions. Um, maybe they need to be brought back together, but I, I would need a little help with that, so I can't really address that, um, that bit so directly immediately. Um, yeah, maybe that, that gives you something, at least in reaction to all, all the stuff, most, most of what you were coming up with. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I can see a number of questions. One, two, three. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I think you might have just answered my question, uh -oh. but I'm not a philosopher, so That's okay. they may be lovely. Yeah, all right, I'll do my best. But when you're talking about the cognitive difference and you're thinking about Mother Teresa is Mother Teresa and Mother Teresa is Agnes, yes. do we then have a reference point for what Agnes is that we all understand as being Agnes as distinct from Mother Teresa? My hope is, um, okay, so let me actually let me go slowly. Um, you ask. When I say we all knew that Mother Teresa is Mother Teresa, but now we've learned that Mother Teresa is Agnes, um, now you say, is there now a reference point for a kind of distinction that's implicit, notwithstanding the discovery of identity? And I think maybe the right answer is yes. Um, the mind obviously um, is involved in some variety of unification in thought, but the unification has to start from fragmentation. Because if there was already unity, you can't unify what is already unified. So there had to have been some diversity that is then um, in some way, I'm not saying it's eliminated, because I don't think the, the I mean, it, it needn't be, but there is a variety of unification that occurs in the space of some diversity. Frege had that diversity as implicit in the meanings of the word. So Agnes you know, has one mode of presentation of the person, and Mother Teresa has some other mode of presentation of the person. And then, so that's how we get that the sentence with those words can be a different meaning than the sentence that just has the Mother Teresa words. Um, I'm saying that's not the right way to go about it. Maybe Mother Teresa and Agnes have the same meanings, the words, but your question I think is fair, and, and my answer is yes, there is a diversity in the thought of the subject who learned, and the, what the learning consisted in was the unifying in a way of what were disparate elements in thought. Yeah, so I think maybe the answer is yes, so good. I think you're getting it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, yeah, thank you, that was uh, very interesting. I want to bring you back to your answer to the first question. Ah. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> My lack of answer to the first question. <laughs> <laughs> so the, key, the key thought that I had there was that there has to be the right kind of relation between you say what you say and you think what you think. The question is what kind of relation is that? And the concern is are we not just recreating the problem higher up? Um, I, you know, again, as I said to Stephen, I don't think I have an adequate answer. I'm, I'm really kind of, in a way, um, if I'm getting anything, it's the sort of program for where an answer will eventually maybe be found. Um, I, maybe this will come as a surprise to you, but I think it may be not, I think it may be related to another issue we find in a very different part of philosophy, um, which is, um, you kind of find it in the mind-body problem. Um, you find it in, um, you know, behaviors under one, the, the being under a description of a behavior in action theory. In general, I think we have a persistent sort of phenomenon in philosophy, um, which is what relation between some bit of the physical world 
Um, and something that may seem in some way like normative, like really special, like um, the kind of thing for which you can be blamed or that can mark you out as rational or something. On the one hand, it's atoms in the void. Yeah, bumping up against each other. We've got some principles that govern, you know, these molecules bouncing around. And we think, what the hell? I don't see anything like rationality or like being good in all this bouncing around of molecules, but, but we know there is such a thing as being good. And so then we gotta figure out what relation between this, this being good stuff and this bouncing around of molecule stuff constitutes that being a case of being good or being irrational, what have you. I'm thinking it's gonna be like that and so that's a deep and perennial issue, but it's gonna be like that in the sense that there's this thinking what you think thing going on, and that puts you into a domain of rational relations. That marks you out as a thinker, as someone who can reason, as someone who can respond to reasons, as someone who's now on the hook for not making bad inferences, so on and so forth. And then you open your mouth, and now sound and acoustic blasts and uh, inscriptions and interactions in a causal space and pointings and so on. Um, and something else happens there. There's reference there too. Um, the bees do it. Uh, but when there's connections, and what does connection consist? That's the common question that I think you and Stephen are asking. And, and you're saying, yeah, well, if you give us that the contents of thoughts are actually phenomena that can be made sense of in terms of, in, in the space of nature, in terms of in a very complicated way, in a subtle way, I think it's gonna require additional theoretical resources, of course. But if you give us it, we can make it out in those terms, then we won't have this big gap that we'll later have to like jump over. You're right about that. You're right about that. I, I face that, that challenge and I, and I haven't solved it. So fair point. I, I, you know, I, there's, you know, there's some negative um, entries on the ledger. Uh, tonight was an attempt to boast of the positive elements. Yes. In Richard Rorty's philosophy and the mirror of nature, um, he argues that um, we don't need a notion of a mind. We don't need a notion of thought. He makes an example of some alien race which are just like humans, but they never came up with the idea of thought. They can express things totally. And even the first um, lecturer in this series, uh, Chad Hansen, when he was talking about ancient Chinese, um, philosophy of language, he talked about how they don't have a notion of mind, they don't, they can get along without it, right? Um, so, um, they, all of these thinkers, um, some other ones probably as well, um, all have, are all kind of saying, uh, we can get along totally without mind and thought, but we can't get along without language. Yeah. If you're saying that a language um, can't come prior to mind, yeah. um, how would you respond to that? That's I mean, my first thought is just to have a bit of fun. I mean, so. Um, they may, th I, I take it, they think it's sort of important that we know um, that we can get along without minds. Um, but um, one thing that a community that didn't have a concept of minds couldn't do would be to embrace um, that fact, the fact you just mentioned, that we can do without minds. If we don't so much as have a concept of minds, then were somehow, something that's unavailable to us is the thing that Rorty, I guess, thought it was important for us to know, which is that we can get along without minds. How can a community that doesn't have a concept of minds appreciate this very important fact that we've now learned from Rorty? That I feel like there's a kind of internal um, risk that you run in saying that it's very important that we know that um, we can get along without the concept of mind. I feel like you've sort of, in a way, undermined um, your point in saying that, at least saying it that way. There's ways, there's ways around that. So that's why I say I want to start with that, because I think there's something um, self, it's not quite self-defeating exactly, but there's something awkward about the assertion um, as if it were an important one that we can do without the concept of mind, um, we say, using that concept therein. Um, so that, that's troubling to me. Um, then one can just engage the question about whether we really could. What would be the cost? I mean, can in some sense. Um, you know, rocks do it. They get along without the concept of mind. There they are, years later, doing fine, that rock. Um, so in some sense that we could get along at what cost? You know, there's a lot that rocks can't get 
up to, um, thanks to their failure to have any concepts. Um, so that would be another thing I'd want to engage. Just what um, is implicit in the idea that we can do without? You were next, I think. Uh, so you said um, there's no order to thought and speech, uh, thought and uh, language. But in babies, we see that you know um, they think first and then they express, they, they, emo uh, they, they verb verbally say something. So, yeah. Uh, so obviously there, there could be some ordering and my yes. second uh, uh, question was by, by connection do you mean something like uh, pointing at something uh, um, yeah. and, and, and then you would have to consider embodiment, uh, thought and embodiment and then yes. that fits very well with the mind-body aspect. Absolutely, right? yes. I do think embodiment is an important um, implicit issue in this area. And I haven't said anything about it. And I, and I do think it's, actually, I think it's funny that you said that because actually the question about what's going on with babies, um, to what extent there's anything really, ling well, at various times, different things seem to be going on, of course, as development uh, proceeds. Um, but at some points in the development of a baby, um, the development of a child, um, it looks like what's going on physically is not a linguistic phenomenon yet. Um, there's more a kind of embodiment of um, some elements of consciousness. Um, and whether, and, and I, you know, I definitely agree that the physical can, can stand to the mental in various important relations. Um, indeed, that's going to be the, the terrain in which I'm going to seek an answer to the first question. Um, what relations between the mental and the physical uh, are the ones that could constitute that use of that language being an expression of the thought, given that it's not just a matter of identity of the meaningfulness of the, the linguistic item. So, so anyway, so that's just to emphasize how much I agree with the idea that embodiment is a crucial player in this space, and also to try to use it to resist a little bit the idea that it's clear. I, I think it's a very controversial question to what extent um, language, even in babies, um, is posterior, you know, development of language is posterior uh, to um, the development of conceptual capacities. I and mean, you know, there's lots of people who think that these things are, come more or less together, uh, each helping the other in, very, in a very complex feedback. Um, a lot of literature on that stuff that I, I'm not very expert on, I'll be honest, but I've heard enough to know that there's a lot of controversy about that in, in the uh, psychological literature. Um, so I, I, um, so I'm not ready to commit to the, the initial claims, but I am ready to accept the later claims. And indeed, in part, I'm not ready to accept the initial claims because of how much I agree with the later claims about the, the significance of embodiment as, a, as an important uh, thing to keep an eye on in this space. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go for it. Yeah, I'm worried that I don't really understand the, the, the resolution of the star sentence that seems central to what you're talking about. And um, I mean, you seem to be saying that was it, uh, Frigo wanted to use a semantic mechanism yeah. to make it true. Yeah. But that met, quickly brought up problems. Yeah. And the way around the problem yeah. is to differentiate between the thought in language yeah. and the thought. But it seems to me, this is what I worry about, yeah. that even if you have the thought, unless it, your thought of Gerber is so purely the man who showed the incompleteness of the rhythm tape, you have no image of what Gerber looks like, or anything else about Gerber, which seems unlikely in practice, um, then that doesn't get you out of trouble. You've still got to you have still got a, a false belief. <laughs> um, well, I'll need help with that. The idea is supposed to be that actually the more you have in mind, the easier it's going to be to get things right. Yeah. Um, because what we're looking for um, is a distinction in thought. Yeah. Even while at the, so to speak, sentence level, we erase all that back out. And it turns out that Cicero, Tully, they just have all the same meaning. It's just, you know, it's just the person. It's just that order. But Schmidt and Gödel don't really have the same meanings in the same way. Do 
Well, so the proposal is that maybe we should allow that they do, that a lot of what was pushing us to say that they don't yeah. are various observations that we make, ordinary observations, ready to hand. It's like, well, no, look, someone could believe that Cicero is an orator without knowing that Tully is an orator. Yeah. So how can they have the same meaning? Look, I just said those sentences by way of expressing the point that you could have the one and not the other. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to you, to you making this big distinction between linguistic thinking. I'm very sympathetic to that. But um, this particular example seems yes. not to free you from language because you've got this the man who said the incomplete sort of written to Yeah, it's funny you say that. Thing. Yeah, yeah, it's very funny you say that. You're absolutely right that there is something that didn't come up at all that I have to come clean with now in response to this, which is just. Remember that I'm here talking to you all. <laughs> I'm giving a presentation. I'm doing it in language. And, and I'm, in some sense, my view is that my own view is inexpressible. Because <laughs> a view is a kind of conceptual framework that I think reveals things as they are, connects with reality in a very deep way. And then I got to tell you about it. And that's when it all kind of goes wrong, because then I come up with these English words, and I start saying things like Cicero, and I start saying things like names, and I start saying things like reference, and, you know, is about, and, and it's all hopeless. So I agree. There is, a, there is an issue. Now, now, of course, the question you could say, I mean, there, one of you is to say, well, look, if you've got an ineffable view, so much the worse for you. And I'll say, I'm not surprised you think that, person who thinks that language and thought are correlative and the one could take the other's form and so on. From my point of view, if you, if you adopted my point of view, the very, its ineffability is, you know, just what you'd expect. But there's one, there's one, one maybe very slight, not perfect way out of it, okay. is to consider a kind of thinking which is expressed, but not in words, yes. drawing. Sure. Okay, now, Barry, and then um, just you'll have to remind me. Thank you. Yes. Okay, good. I'll come to you in a second. So, so David, I'm bringing you back up again, I'm afraid, to the first question and the development of it. But it, I, it's, it's, really, it's really just to ask you about options here. So, I mean, when things are going well, you're using language, yes. and you're thinking, yes. and you've got about this in thinking, you've got about this in language, and working in parallel. But if you stop for a moment to consider how language puts things in mind for us, because we read a lot about things we've never encountered, thought about, people tell us about things that we've never heard about. So the question is whether, does that sort of sponsor a placeholder in thought that says, defer reference to whatever the word is, mm -hmm. And then maybe later in the sentence or in their discourse, you, they might say something which you have thought about. Yes. And do you then, as it were, have some jumble like code switching, a bit of thought and a bit of language, as if you were constantly going from one railway track to another and it wasn't obvious they were all completely full in both of their manifestations, but there was really a jumble between the two. Is it something like that? Yeah, so I, I, maybe the best way to answer is to accept something that I think is implicit in the, in the point, um, and, and because it may help me, uh, though it looks like, it may look like it hurts, which is to say that although there is the meaningfulness of language, the, the, the connection that language achieves to, to other things, and I claim that's very different in its nature to the meaningfulness of thought and the way thought connects to things, among the things thought can connect to is language. Yeah. And if that's, so among the elements of thought, among the things mm -hmm. we can think with, among the senses, as Frey called them, um, there can be some that have a kind of linguistic character. Um, that, I claim, does not undermine my point. On the contrary, it's consistent with it. And then I think it may, in a, in a way that may look less problematic, help with the the issue you're raising about how sometimes when we're reading about something we have no other idea. It's, it's, it's as if it were just a word to us. You know, when I first read about muons, I don't know, you know, just it's a, it's a muon. You know, basically I got some physical characteristic that 
as useful. I mean, I had a bit more because I had that much. I've got all this other stuff too, is, you know, whatever this person's talking about, whatever is being used in physical theory these days, you know, so, so you got a bit more, but maybe very little. And so you've got that marker, I think what you were calling, I mean, basically it may be that what you take away is a linguistic set, the thing that gets called muon. Kripke in his book spends a lot of time talking about how Frege had better not use that as senses because that would be circular. And I think Frege, and I think Kripke's right about that. Frege had better not use it. But I'm claiming that once you're not in the business of a reductive theory of linguistic meaning, once you've made the separation, now you can use it. Because I do think some of our thoughts, all of which connect through the mediation of a sense, some of those senses can involve linguistic items. And then there's no circularity because, you know, it's just, you were calling it a jumble, and I think that's fair enough. It, it, there are two things uh, things are coming back together, but in a way that doesn't undermine the initial separating, or so I claim. That, that would be my attempt um, to kind of take, take that on board. Okay, um, one more over here. Did you want to? Thank you so much. I'll, I'll bring out two points. Uh, one is, it was already kind of mentioned a little bit, the dick dick, the perspectival. And I think you already kind of covered it a little bit by saying, you know, prefacing that logic may not be that, yeah, so that you know, there's this kind of point of view of everywhere, you know, the, the omnipresent hammer that uh, hammers the nails and so on. Uh -huh. So you already kind of touched okay. on it. Okay, but good. if you have anything more to say about the difference between the perspectival, yes. the omnipresent, uh -huh. and the uh, non-perspectival, if you'd like, yeah. all those ambiguities. And um, whilst you're kind of brewing with that, yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll mention, what was the other one? Oh, the inexpressibility and the expressibility. Ah, right. yeah. Because again, through, and you can see this in kind of proto-musicality in infants, you know, and the, and the thought, yeah. you know, that can be expressed, say a mathematical thought that can't be expressed so easily in words or even logic, uh -huh. but perhaps in a sort of geometric, if you'd like, visual uh -huh. fashion, or, uh, you know, a composer might maybe, express... Yeah. Maybe you, you should know. talk to the gentleman about painting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Right. But I guess the, the, point, the point is, you know, to what extent, yeah. um, you know, are we giving something? We're giving a mapping, we're giving a sketch, we're yeah. expressing something, it's just incomplete. Oh. And in that, in that sense, we might awaken a resonance yeah. in the other through their own experiences and their, through their own constitution. To, to grasp more than what we've actually said mm -hmm. uh, by, by triggering, if you'd like, that kind of resonance in the other through the linguistic medium of sharing. So those are the yeah. Okay, well, there's a lot there, and, I, and I, I would, I, I'm going to, in fact, need more brewing time about the perspectival. I, you know, I'm a fan, th though I resisted the idea that uh, privacy is particularly, um, you know, a distinctive or characteristic feature of the mental um, I'm not so resistant to the idea that perspectivality is a distinctive characteristic of feature. So I think there's sympathy between us on that, um, but I'm not sure that I have a lot to say that's helpful yet about it. Um, on the second thing, the idea that there might be other physical phenomena that might better serve um, the idea that um, there might be physical expressibility of thought after all, um, that we can, in some sense, reveal in physical form um, there can be an identity of the meaning of the physical item, the meaning of the painting, the meaning of the symphony, the meaning of this incomplete thing, um, and the meaning of the thought. There can be an identity there. That I do resist, actually. That I'm, I'm hesitant about because I think that, that the very idea that there might be incompleteness, at least as I interpret it, holds out the promise of completeness. Um, and unless the notion of incompleteness is supposed to be one which is somehow terminal, it's, it's, it's a kind of essential incompleteness. Um, and then I wonder why we use in completeness, because um, anyway, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot there, and I'm not sure I have anything that useful to say, but I, I'm worried that um, the same issue will arise, that at the end of the day, the phenomena that might enable the linguistic item to have um, the meaning that it does um, will not reproduce the phenomena that enable the mental to have the meaning it does. And that's because the causal character of the being meaningful of physical items 
um, cannot um, reproduce the normative character of the meaning, meaningful of the mental items. And so um, there's a kind of ineliminable duality to the two phenomena. So I, uh, this time I wasn't suggesting that the, ah, okay. it's you know, there's an identity there. Yes. That I was suggesting that there might be a kind of a, an inroad into something yeah. that's, that is constitutionally open or infinite, yeah. that isn't necessarily something that can be grasped or, or parsed in a okay. kind of finite Good. linguistic means. That's one thing. Ah, and for so the that first, the issue, yes. Yes, yes. Once we're in the, once then if, if you're thinking, oh, well, we've got, we can still have something there, even if it's not the identity of meaning that you oppose yeah. generally, um, then, I, then I agree again, but then I wonder why the distinction between the linguistic and these things. Why would the linguistic somehow be prevented distinctively? The thing that we thought was likeliest to enable a kind of revelation of the mental, even though it doesn't have you know, the identity, that is blocked. And then the thing that we thought, well, good luck um, using that for the revelation of the mental, that now turns out in this scheme to be the thing that's better positioned for the revelation. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that's hopeless, but I'm now interested in why we should think it. Why I suppose that the thing that has less structure, the thing that is somehow um, less constrained maybe, uh, has, you know, it doesn't have a recursive character, it doesn't have the kind of structural restrictions on the linguistic that enables a kind of expressibility there. And why should we think that that now is better suited to do this thing that I'm claiming, you know, kind of the ideal version of is forever uh, prevented? Well, I think we need to leave the, 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 I'm aware that there are other questions in the room, but we've worked David pretty hard and we're over time. So I think we have to draw things to a close. Thank you. Thank you.